leave messages for me here if you have to. Give me names, dates. I'll see to it the money gets paid. And run hard deals. These guys put up a million dollars, so let's make sure this changed, because I figure we ought to keep it. Hmm? Certainly. Everybody goes home. Second in. Vive la mort, vive la guerre, vive le sacré mercenaire. That was Christopher Walken as a soldier of fortune with last minute battle plans for his fellow mercenaries in The Dogs of War, one of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Sneak Previews. Across the aisle from me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, in addition to The Dogs of War, we'll also be reviewing Richard Dreyfuss and Amy Irving in the competition, Roman Polanski's new film, Tess, which is an adaptation of the Thomas Hardy novel, and now, Roger starts with the thriller Eyewitness. Well, Eyewitness is the portrait of some engaging and complicated human beings who just happen to get involved in a killing. William Hurt is the movie star. He plays a janitor who knows or thinks he knows the identity of the killer. Sigourney Weaver is a TV news reporter who covers the crime, and that's just great with Hurt because he's got a crush on her and he watches her devoutly every night on television. So Hurt decides to give her his exclusive inside story on the killing. <laughs> Lieutenant Black told me I'm supposed to talk to reporters. And I guess you're it. I'm the night janitor in the building here. We'll meet you on the north side of the building. Murphy, give me a two shot and then it gets interesting, you know. Okay? Yeah. You're beautiful. Thank you. It's okay. Um, we're here with the uh, with a man who works the night shift as a maintenance supervisor. We're really just a janitor. In the building where Nien Long was killed. What's your name? Um, my name is Daryl Deaver. I've had this job for about two years. Uh, it's a nice job. It's quiet. Nobody to push me around. Uh, what do you know about the murder of Mr. Long? Nothing. I just found out about it. Then why are we having this interview? Since you asked me, I'll tell you, I have had a crush on you for about two years. I haven't been faithful to you, but I doubt that you've been faithful to me. All that can change. Cut. Cut. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> Unless you left something out. I did. I wait a minute. Wait, wait. Are you rolling? Okay. What? You ready? Yes. I would really like to see you again. I would just love it. Look. I'm really busy, and uh, since you don't seem to know anything. What if I did? Well, does he or doesn't he? The question is, does he really know something about the crime, or does he just want a date with Sigourney Weaver? This movie has a lot of questions in it. It's a tantalizing thriller that teases us with false clues and blind alleys. Along the way, it establishes James Woods as a prime suspect. Woods is one of William Hurt's fellow janitors. He's been missing for several days when he surprises Hurt in the basement of the building where they both work. machine open I, I pressed the button it was habit okay you okay you could have killed me could have broken my glasses too I've been looking for you everywhere I'm in a lot of trouble Daryl I told you damn it didn't I tell you yeah I thought I'd hide out here okay you know I mean like see nobody thinks of looking for me here right I wanted you and Linda to get married. You know, I wanted like a family. Place to go on Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know. 
I open the door. Hey, here's Aldo. You know, everybody glad to see me for once. <laughs> you don't kill a man for that. The movie has a lot of fun with situations like that trash compactor uh, scene where you have a lot of danger and it turns out to be a false alarm. Keeps you on your toes. Eyewitness was written by Steve Tesich and directed by Peter Yates, and they're the same writer and director team who made Breaking Away. Now, you might say this thriller has absolutely nothing in common with Breaking Away, but I think in a sense it does. Both movies make their characters a lot more important than their plots. It's not what happens that's so important, but how it affects these people and how they react to it. And that makes Eyewitness one of those rare thrillers like The Third Man or The China Syndrome, where the crimes are secondary to the characters. This is a really exciting, classy thriller. I think you make the proper distinction between the characters and the plot here, because I think there's a real gap in the quality. I like the characters. I'm interested in Sigourney Weaver and William Hurt and their relationship throughout the film, and I mm -hmm. wish they had gone off someplace and been somewhere else other than this movie, because this movie <laughs> to me is really sort of crazy. I mean, you've got uh, Jewish immigrants in Russia, Jewish people living in Russia who want to get out. You've got horses in a barn in New York that want to get out. You've got somebody into the mob for $250,000, and the mobsters would never loan this guy that much money. I mean, it's a cornball, mixed-up plot for me that I didn't like, I like the characters. Well, then in that case, we have a big disagreement. Not only did I like this intriguing relationship with William Hurt and Sigourney Weaver, and this is Hurt's first movie, by the way, since Altered States, mm -hmm. but I like the plot, too. A lot of thrillers start out with really complicated plots that turn out to have a really dumb solution. In this movie, it gets more and more complicated as it goes along, and I think that's a compliment to the intelligence of the audience that both the characters and the plot are allowed to be so complex and to all pay off at the okay. end. What you seem to be suggesting is that I'm sitting here not in favor of complicated plots that reward the audience for the intelligent. Don't lay well, that not, on me. Not but for a I'm, million dollars would well, I say I'm that. Set, but I'm very clear here. The kind of movie you're talking about is something like Chinatown, very convoluted, uh -huh. interesting plot. The red herrings mean something. Here, it's just a mishmash as far as I'm concerned. Again, I stress, I like the two characters. Well, we have a disagreement okay. in that case. All right, our next film is named Tess, based on Thomas Hardy's novel, Tess of the Dubervilles, written in 1891. It's the story of a poor working girl of that era who is brutally confronted by the power and conservatism of the middle and upper class England as she tries to rise out of her lowly place in life. Nastasia Kinski stars in the title role of Tess. She's sent by her parents to the home of some wealthy landowners. Her parents think she might be related to them. Turns out, though, ironically, the landowners, the Dubervilles, really bought their name and their title. And when Tess confronts their son, who she thinks might be her cousin, she finds that he is interested in her as something more than a long lost relation. I came, sir, to tell you that we're of the same family as you. Ah, poor relations. Yes. Stokes? No, Durbervilles. Yes, yes, I meant Durbervilles. Tell me, do you like strawberries? Yes, when they're in season. Here they already are. I would rather take it from my own hand. <laughs> Don't be so coy, my pretty cousin. Tess, set in England but filmed in France, is an exquisite film with the beauty of a landscape painting and the energy of tempestuous Victorian drama, as in this scene where Cousin Alec continues his pursuit of Tess. Don't hold my arm! Grab me round the waist! Hungry 
for little Nix. Why abandon me as soon as you feel safe? The danger came of your foolishness. I say, what a temper. When people are on top of the hill, they have to get down somehow. But not at a gallop, surely. Fancy being asked that by a brave little beauty like you. I always go downhill at a gallop. You can't beat it for stirring the blood. But perhaps you needn't do so again. Perhaps not. All depends. One little kiss on those ruby lips, or even on that satin cheek, and I drive at a snail's pace. Word of honor. But I don't want to be kissed, sir. Stop, stop, I beg you. Very well. Do as you wish, I don't mind. Oh, boy. But I thought you'd protect oh. me, being a kinsman. Kinsman be hanged. After burying the illegitimate son of that man, Tess is crushed and recovers only to marry the son of a parson in another love relationship that is built upon lies. Tess is a rare motion picture, a romantic costume drama, the kind of film that Hollywood seems to have stopped making completely. This is an exceptionally beautiful movie. Gene, I'm in total agreement with you. I love Tess. I feel a lot of warmth toward it. And you know, it's funny because sometimes when I go to films of 19th century novels, I feel as if I'm back in English lit class. For example, about 12 years ago, they made a film of Thomas Hardy's novel, Far From the Madding Crowd. Right. And I felt it was like an audiovisual aid, but not at <laughs> all with this film by Roman Polanski. Right. There's so much humanity in this film and so much passion, and I could really identify with Natasia Kinski as Tess. I thought she had a lot of dignity, a lot of composure, and a very simple performance. It really is a very modern character, a contemporary character. Here's a woman who uh, is pushed by her family to jump in class a little bit, gets in trouble there. Uh, falls for one man who has designs on her in another way, then finds another man who can't accept her past. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very interesting film. Uh, for, this is the kind of movie that I just wish that Hollywood would make more of. I don't think it's going to happen, frankly. This is a very exceptional kind of filmmaking done by Polanski. Well, I'd recommend going out of your way to see it. Mm -hmm. right? Our next movie is called The Competition, and it's a cornball romance with a soft center, a ridiculous subplot, and a soundtrack that could be peddled in late night TV commercials as the dozen greatest piano concertos ever written. Call this number now. Well, <laughs> does it sound as if I don't like the film? Maybe it does, and yet, you know, I felt a real affection toward this film after all. The competition is such an unabashedly engaging love story, you get caught up in the romance and you forgive the faults. Here's one of the movie's key scenes. Competitor Amy Irving has fallen in love with her arch rival, Richard Dreyfus, and her piano teacher, Lee Remick, doesn't like it one bit because love has no place in a competition. Have you ever heard of competitive edge in which one looks for ways to dislike one's opponents? This is not an ashram, sweetie face. This is a battleground. Oh, it's always the messy ones, the irregular weaves. If you have an itch, God knows I understand that. What's wrong with that punk from the Bronx? He's got a super body and I'll bet some notion of how to use it. Jerry, he'd be okay, why? infidelity to that that is your first husband that you you marry it the way a nun marries jesus you cleave to it because it gives your life a center that no man that very few men can possibly give you least of all a rival for the thing your life is centered on do you know do you have any idea what a drain that can be it's no drain at all, damn it, Greta. You're wrong for once. If anything, he doesn't take enough from me. He's feeling a lot of no, pressure. No, I do not want to hear about his problems. I don't want to know what they are, and neither do you. If we're pretty, and aren't we both, and if we're accomplished, and are you not, and wasn't I, there will always come along a man who is what Eleanor Roosevelt used to refer to as less fortunate than ourselves. Lee Remick is terrific in this mm -hmm. movie. She has a lot of fire. Mm -hmm. This movie has interesting insights into the nature of the competition between men and women. Should Amy Irving let Richard Dreyfuss win because she loves him so much and because he needs to win so badly? Or is he just pulling a con job trying to psych her into losing? Well, that's the history of their relationship that leads up to this scene. I came here to tell you that I am a liar. I realized it this morning when I woke up and you weren't there. I'm a liar about you and me and what all that means. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. I don't want to wait about anything. That's all I've been doing is that, waiting. Been waiting to win, as if that's going to change my life. And that was fine until I ran into you and kept running into you. And then things began to happen. 
like that morning on the steps when you yelled at me. I mean, let's face it. Nobody looks that good in direct sunlight. So it's not like you're such a knockout. But you stood there, reading me off, and I could see the blotches on your skin and the discoloration under your eyes and tiny hairs in your head. And none of it mattered because I wanted you so much I couldn't make a fist. I wanted to climb inside you and wrap you around me like a blanket. And now I know that that is more important than this damn misbegotten competition. Let me finish. Okay. So what I really feel about you and me is that we are a corporation. Now, if you win, great. If I win, better. <laughs> and if neither of us wins, then the hell with it, but the corporation goes on. And I wish to hell that I could have answered you like this the night before, but I just wasn't seeing straight. So I lied. I'll never lie to you again. And if you think that that was easy. I'll be waiting for a yes or no answer. You can kind of feel that intensity there as they're competing between their love for each other and all their ambitions. It's a real nice relationship. This movie has a lot of rough edges in it, though, as I suggested. And like, for example, a subplot about a Russian piano teacher <laughs> who defects to the United States. That's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. All that cloak and dagger stuff is an unnecessary distraction as far as I'm concerned. But the competition, for all of its faults, is definitely a movie filled with life, energy, competitive passion, and of course, it's got all those concertos. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right about the word passion. I think that's the key to why this film uh -huh. is successful. Lee Remick is just wonderful. She's passionate. She wants her pupil to win. Mm -hmm. Amy Irving and Richard Dreyfuss are passionate about winning the competition and winning each other mm -hmm. in some way. Mm -hmm. I sat there watching this movie and guessing with my wife, I said, now, I know who's going to win. Mm -hmm. I, and I was off every single time. I must have guessed five different times. There are only mm -hmm. six mm -hmm. people. <laughs> this film got me totally involved. And I think it's because I love seeing movies about characters with special skills and talents. Mm -hmm. That's always exciting. You learn something. You watch someone's love for their craft. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very fine movie. Now, Gene, I know this is going to surprise you, but I really don't have too much to add. I agree with everything you've said. I just have one point, a small point, but it's kind of a movie critic's point. It's kind of neat in this film that you can see that Amy Irving and Richard Dreyfuss are really touching the keys. They're playing the piano. Yeah. It doesn't cut back and forth from their hands to their face. I was impressed. You know, you sit there and you say, I don't know how they did that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Our next film, The Dogs of War, is a powerful thriller that begins well, but falls apart for me at least at the very end, just when we're expecting the most exciting action. Christopher Walken stars in The Dogs of War as an American soldier of fortune, a paid rifle for hire who gets in and out of situations like this one in exotic foreign places. you pimp. Everybody comes with me, goes home. Let's go. Hey! Let's see this thing fly!
A very exciting opening to the movie, and after that escape, Walken is hired by an international minerals company to get some intelligence on a new African dictator. They want Walken to assemble a group of mercenaries, go into that African country, and assassinate the leader. The minerals company wants to put their own man in as president. Here's the scene in a London hotel room where Walken and his colleagues examine some photographs of a scale model of the presidential compound that they have to infiltrate. Don't go by this. It takes longer to go from here to here. That'll give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. These are good. You didn't take them. No. They were a gift. Sure. You want a beer? Yeah. Sir? Sure. Yeah. What is this? Coffee or tea? It's terrible. He always home? He will be. Zangano has an Independence Day coming up. He'll be there for it. How long are we going to hold it? As long as it takes to fly the new president in from the border. Mm -hmm. Where's it going to be? <laughs> Nixon. <laughs> That's not funny, Drew. Come on, Jamie. Punch up your brief and try a few jokes. Anyway, I spoke to Ginger. He's going to pick up and train as many Zangaran exiles as he can. Oh, they won't be worth it. Listen, Ginger's OK. They'll be ready. He'll fight. What do we do with Kimba? Just give him over to the new government. He gets loose again. Oh, I'm hungry. Anybody want a pizza? No, I'll have a cheese roll. Oh, yeah, I'd, cheese I'd roll. like a, a twinkle pudding. A what? Yeah, you know, with a lot of soul sauce. And Come on, Michelle, split a pepperoni with me. Anybody want to know how we're going to do this? That's a big build-up to the assassination scene, but frankly, those scenes at the end of the movie are really pretty boring, and particularly when compared to the first time Walken visits that African country on his own. Those early scenes are exciting. The danger seems real. We do get a feeling of what it must be like to operate as a soldier for hire. But the last half of the movie, surprisingly, is a big letdown, leaving me with very mixed feelings about Dogs of War, sort of half a movie. You know, Gene, you put me in a very strange position here because I like the movie enough to recommend it, but at the same time, I agree with your criticisms. And that is, the film begins very in a very interesting way. It's based on this book by Frederick Forsyth. I guess he knows all about mercenaries. Mm -hmm. It's the portrait of the character and behavior of a real mercenary soldier. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Yes. And then at the end, it's just action. It's just 20 minutes of that same old footage we've seen 100 times before. Storm the barricades, pull out the machine guns, throw the hand grenades, knock the sniper yeah. off his perch. We've seen that a hundred times, and it's just a letdown. We wanted more than that. Yeah, because you do have this expectation. I thought, for example, that we were really getting inside this uh -huh. uh, mercenary character. I thought, for example, that maybe at the end, they'd pull a real switch, and he would decide not mm -hmm. to go in. He might have a moral crisis, something surprising, not standard action, like you said. You know what I think they do sometimes? They start out with a really original insight, like mm -hmm. this portrait of a mercenary soldier, and they say, well, we can do that for 90 minutes on our own, our insight, our inspiration, but then at the end, we have to give the people 30 minutes of what they expect so they mm -hmm. think they got their money's worth. <laughs> well, here's Spot the Wonder Dog to bring on some films that won't give anybody their money's worth. It's time for Dog of the Week, where Roger and I each pick the week's worst movies. Well, gee, my dog this week is one of the dumbest, most ineptly acted, worst directed, most incredibly boring movies <laughs> that I've ever seen. Wow. It's an all-time dog, and it's called Land of the Minotaur. Now, you know what a minotaur mm -hmm. is. It's a Greek god with the body of a man and the head of a bull. Well. This movie is more than half full. <laughs> the Minotaur itself looks like a plaster of Paris statue with two blowtorches stuck up its nose. <laughs> Peter Cushing stars as a baron who makes human sacrifices to the Minotaur. Donald Pleasance plays a priest who organizes resistance to the pagans. And meanwhile, lots of girls run around screaming while they're chased by Minotaur worshippers with hoods on their heads. <laughs> this movie sets some kind of a record for Peter Cushing, the veteran British movie Dracula who's been in dozens of bad movies. Land of the Minotaur is, without any doubt, the worst Peter Cushing movie of all time. That might make a good trivia question in a couple of years. <laughs> My Dog of the Week is The Last Challenge of the Dragon, a <laughs> thoroughly ridiculous kung fu movie. How ridiculous? Well, how about a scene where the father of a crazy mixed-up family tells his 25-year-old daughter, why don't you just act like a girl and then maybe <laughs> someone will marry you? Or how about the son-in-law who tells his wife not to worry that her brother has stolen $10,000 from her purse to feed his gambling <laughs> habit. Says the brother-in-law, oh, you know, he's always doing that. <laughs> uh, of course, kung fu movies specialize in kicks to the head, not witty dialogue. So maybe it's more important to say the last challenge of the dragon is people with their faces all cut up before <laughs> anybody's foot crashes into their mouth. This is a true dog. You know, they're always doing that. Right. <laughs> That's enough for the dogs. Let's briefly recap our reviews of the four big movies on this show. Eyewitness is the new thriller starring William Hurt as a janitor and Sigourney Weaver as a TV reporter. I thought it was great. The thriller is character study. Gene liked the characters but thought the story they were in was ridiculous. 
I recommend you see it. Gene cannot. Two big yes votes, though, for Roman Polanski's Tess, starring Nastasia Kinski as Thomas Hardy's doomed and courageous heroine. We both thought it was fascinating filmmaking. Two more yes votes for the competition. Although it has some big flaws, we both like the romance and competitive spirit of its story about an international piano contest. The Dogs of War starred Christopher Walken as a mercenary soldier fighting in Africa. I vote yes. I thought it started out as a superior action movie and had some serious undertones. Gene liked the movie's profile of a mercenary soldier, but we both found the climatic action scenes very routine, and Gene votes no. Well, I think the film that we're coming out in favor of the most is Roman Polanski's right. Test, and I think it's important to me that this film do well. Otherwise, it's sort of an adult kind of story. Mm -hmm. I think otherwise we're going to be just swamped with teenage violent films. I hope not. We both liked the competition, too, with reservations. I liked all four films on this show, but gee, you know, the one I would go out into the raging storm to see again would be Roman Polanski's Tess. Or even in the sunshine, depending okay. where you live, okay? Why not? Next time on Sneak Previews, Roger and I will review five more new films, including Sunday Lovers, a romantic comedy with Gene Wilder, My Bloody Valentine about some college kids attending a very scary party, and The Last Metro, Francois Truffaut's new film about the German occupation of France during World War II. It stars Catherine Deneuve. So until then, we'll see you at the movies. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.